Hello, welcome to the show. I'm Dr. Ronald Yap. Today we will be continuing our bladder cancer discussion. In part one, we discussed the disease in general and reviewed superficial bladder cancer treatment. In this episode, we will focus on muscle invasive bladder cancer. Dr. Bill Santos, the director of the urologic cancer program at Concord Hospital, joins me again for the discussion. So welcome back, Bill. Good to have you with us again. Thanks for having me, Ron. It's a pleasure to be back. So to recap, bladder cancer comes from the lining, or in today's parlance, the urothelial uh, aspect of the bladder. Um, now we're talking about muscle invasive bladder cancer. Can you help the audience as far as what that means uh, between the superficial urothelial sure. layer and the deeper layers? Sure. In terms of a summary, bladder cancer starts from the lining of the bladder. Um, it's a cancerous process that starts usually because of some chemical exposure. Um, the highest risk factors would be a smoking history or some exposure to various chemicals, uh, metal solvents, leather dye, clothing dye. Patients usually present with blood in the urine. So anytime someone has blood in the urine, that needs evaluation. And then when we diagnose bladder cancer by looking inside the bladder with a telescope, we would then bring a patient to the operating room. Uh, in the operating room, we would look in with a camera and then remove the tumor. And then under the microscope, we can deter determine, is it superficial, just of the lining of the bladder, or does it go beneath that lining down into the muscle of the bladder? And we call that invasive. Now, uh, the majority of bladder cancer is superficial. The 20 or 25 percent, which is invasive, that's really the scary disease that can affect how long a patient lives. Once bladder cancer goes into the muscle, it has the propensity to go to lymph nodes, bones, other parts of the body. Mm -hmm. And a patient can die from bladder cancer if it's not diagnosed and, and treated early. So invasive disease is basically bladder cancer that's gone into the muscle that if left unchecked can go to other parts of the body. So mm -hmm. we approach it very differently. Okay. Now, as far as that being more of a you know, deadly disease, and of course, we know that superficial disease can become muscle invasive. What type of staging do you do for those patients? You mentioned some imaging studies. Um, so most of these patients will have a CAT scan of the abdomen and pelvis. That'll tell us what things look like around the bladder. Uh, does it look like this is something that's growing outside of the bladder? Uh, as well as what the lymph nodes in the pelvis and in the back of the abdomen, the retroperitoneum, look like. So a CAT scan will give us staging locally as well as regionally of the lymph nodes. We'll also do some imaging of the chest to make sure there are no nodules in the lungs. So kind of assessing, is this something that's localized or is this something that already has gone to other parts of the body? Mm -hmm. And then initially, again, looking at the tumor under the microscope to get an idea how deep it goes into the bladder. So that pathology is critical and uh, getting yes. the appropriate depth. A lot of times when people get the scrapings, the, the muscle isn't in that tissue. Yeah. Um, and so having a good pathologist that can review that tissue and knowing what's muscle and what's not, uh, right. very important. So, and as we talked about in the last uh, um, television program, if you find high-grade cancer that goes down just to the base of the lining, you have to make sure you've sampled the muscle underneath. And the first thing we do in that T1 disease, TA is just of the lining, T1 is down to the base of the lining, T2 is into the muscle. If someone has T1 disease, high-grade disease to the base of the lining, even if you've seen muscle, we go back and biopsy it again to make sure there isn't disease in the muscle that you missed. Mm -hmm. Because the stakes, if you miss muscle invasive disease, uh, are, are very high if you don't identify that. Yeah, that's a great point, making sure that you, know, you really accurately stage what's exactly. muscle and what's not. Exactly. Um, so now that you have the patient that unfortunately has the muscle invasive disease, you know, what do you tell them about what's next? I think a lot of people, when they hear about a cancer, they get you know, they, you know, a lot of fear, uh, what's going to happen to me, what's next. Sure. Um, so what do, you, what do you tell that patient about what the next steps are for someone with muscle invasive disease? The most important thing is that the bladder needs to come out, um, and we'll go into detail on that. Giving chemotherapy prior to the bladder coming out can actually extend... Uh, improve your survival rates. So neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy means we give patients chemotherapy before the big surgery. Mm -hmm. And that increases survival somewhere in the 4 to 8 percent range. Now some patients will just want their bladder out and won't want to go through several months of chemotherapy or maybe there are some other medical issues that make it difficult for a patient to get through chemotherapy. 
but if a patient is healthy enough, neoadjuvant chemotherapy is what we recommend before taking the bladder out. Mm -hmm. And that's a pretty a recent thing. Actually, I remember in our training, we would always just take it out first and look at the pathology and then go from there, but there's a pretty significant paradigm shift yeah. Over what time point you think that, that switched from doing it neoadjuvantly or before the surgery to, you know, um, you know uh, afterwards and before? I think, I think uh, over the last uh, eight to ten years, things have switched over to the point that now it's a recommendation mm -hmm. by, uh, you know, our national organization to give neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. Having said that, that doesn't mean that it's done in large volume. Some people will live far away from where medical oncologists are. It's not always easy to give neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Sure. But if you can, it does I improve the survival. Okay. And then before a major surgery, we want to make sure someone is healthy enough for um, a surgical procedure. So often people will meet with their cardiologists or pulmonologists to make sure the heart and the lungs are healthy enough to handle a large surgery. Mm -hmm. Because removing the bladder and the lymph nodes and and then reconstructing the urinary tract is a major surgical procedure with a significant hospitalization and recovery. It's not, like, a, yeah. not an insignificant thing to go through. So let's move on to that because uh, I, I, I think that uh, a bladder removal is one of the biggest surgeries like known to man. And nothing against other surgical colleagues, but I don't know of many procedures where you take out everything and then have to replumb everybody back up. Most surgeries for cancer, you just take it out. But this is a very extensive overhaul. You're taking out the bladder. You're doing extensive lymph node dissections. You're harvesting bowel, and you're reconfiguring everything. So, um, what do you what do you tell the patient about that that initial process? So, as far as what is removed uh, in a male, a radical cystectomy involves removing the bladder and then the prostate adjacent to it, and that is because many bladder tumors will invade down into the prostate. In some rare situations, we have to remove the urethra as well. Most of the time, the urethra would remain intact. And then lymph nodes, which drain the pelvis. And a more extensive lymph node dis dissection has uh, proven to be a more beneficial thing for patients. Mm -hmm. In a woman, uh, a radical cystectomy involves removing the bladder, removing the cervix, uterus, ovaries, and tubes as well as the anterior part of the vagina. Again, it all comes out in one large specimen to contain the tumor and get clean margins around it, as well as the lymph nodes similarly. Uh, that can be done either with an open incision from around the, the, the belly button down to the pubic bone, or it can be done laparoscopically with use of, of robotics, which is how if someone hasn't had a lot of prior abdominal surgery, uh, we prefer to do this surgery robotically. Mm -hmm. So in this situation, we make a, a bunch of small incisions. Uh, we put a camera, a telescope in above the belly button, and then some other instruments where we put trocars into the abdomen that instruments can be passed through. Uh, the robot holds those trocars, and then uh, the robot holds the instruments that go into the patient's abdomen. The surgeon then goes over to a separate console where I put my head into this machine and I control the ends of the instruments. The robot's not doing anything that I'm not doing. It's a master-slave relationship. The movements are scaled down so that when I move my hand like this, the end of the laparoscopic instrument will move a small amount. So the benefit of robotics is that um, the instruments are articulated, so there are wristed instruments for more precise movements. Also, the camera has a right and a left eye and is high definition, so you get depth of field. It's not a two-dimensional image, it's a three-dimensional image. So removing all of these structures and doing lymph node dissections is done in this uh, robotic-assisted laparoscopic technique, which means smaller incisions and less blood loss. Uh, whenever you do something laparoscopically, there's an air pressure of carbon dioxide that's keeping the abdomen inflated, and that air pressure is higher than the pressure in the veins. So when you cut into a structure, the vein will not bleed because the air pressure is almost putting a thumb on it. So uh, we do this large complex removal uh, robotically, and then we need to reconstruct afterwards. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good point to note that as we discussed, the chemotherapy is now moving up front, and robotics is also another huge uh, you know, change in how we do things because uh, before everything was open, and there's still a lot of old schools that do open. It depends on the situation. But by and large, most uh, modern surgeons will try to do this robotically for what you mentioned, you know, less uh, incisions. Um, less pain. Yeah, less pain, uh, less blood loss. Uh, 
a magnification, motion scaling, stereoscopic vision, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And I think younger surgeons uh, are facile with this in their training, and I think it's a great, uh, yeah. you know, help the patient since, you know. I'm uh, lucky that I kind of sit on both ends of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. I, I was trained as an open surgeon, and then I learned laparoscopy and robotics along the way. So although 80% of my surgeries that I do are robotic, I'm very comfortable switching to the open realm if I need sure. to. So I, I feel fortunate that my training kind of fell at that point. Um, yeah, you're new school and old school, huh? Yeah. So, so this is great. Less bleeding, less pain, less incisions. Unfortunately, the patients are still in the hospital about the same length of time if you do it open versus robotically sure. for this particular case. And it's a, it's a Huganga surgery. And so, yeah, so we talked about the removal. How about... I'll, I'll also add one sorry. other thing that uh, we've started a, a new pathway to try to get people's bowel function to return a little faster. There's a medicine called Entereg, which blocks the narcotic receptor in the intestines that patients would start before surgery. And then... Um, we kind of try to advance the diet along a little quicker. So most of the studies show patients can get out the door a day and a half or two days faster if you use this medication and kind of go on this accelerated pathway to try to make the intestines come back a little yeah. quicker. So we're starting to do that this year, and uh, we're hopeful that we'll, patients will be able to get out of the hospital a little sooner just because of this, 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 uh, this pathway to increase intestinal recovery. Yeah. That's another another advance, recent advance, uh, as far as reducing the length of stay. Now, since you mentioned bowel, there's the removal, lymph nodes, and then there's that whole reconstructive part of sure. it. Can you give me a few words about how you replumb somebody? Because there's a, a couple ways you can do it. You know, in the world, there are a couple ways you can do it, and in various parts of the world, there's different you know configurations sure. of bowel to replumb somebody. Sure. Um, so but, but in you, America, tell us how we do this. So we, you take out the bladder and then you've got the ureters which are the tubes that come down from the kidneys and you have to put them somewhere so what do you do with that well historically people tried to bring the ureters to the skin sew them together and bring them to the skin cutaneous ureterostomy the problem is these are delicate little tubes and if you bring them all the way to the skin often the blood flow to the tubes is compromised and they stricture down and scar so that didn't prove to be a very good solution then people tried to hook it to the rectum or the sigmoid colon and have all the urine go out where the stool goes out. Quality of life isn't great with that and mixing urine and stool together, the rate of getting colon cancer at that site is increased by several hundredfold. So people uh, started to develop other types of diversions. The most common diversion which is used is something called an ileal conduit. So this is where a piece of intestine is taken, a piece of small intestine, one end is closed and the ureters are then sewn in to that end and then the other end is brought out to the abdominal wall as a stoma, as a urostomy. So this small piece of intestine is a conduit for the urine outside of the body. The patient then has a small little rosebud, a little bit of intestine turned inside out in the right lower quadrant of the abdomen which is a location that a bag can be affixed to with an adhesive to have the urine continuously flow into that bag. Mm -hmm. Then there's a valve on that bag and a patient every several hours would, would empty that bag. So that is the lowest complication, kind of most rapid way to reconstruct the urinary tract. Mm -hmm. So in a patient who is older or wants the lowest rate of complication, the simplest way to plummet is with an ileal conduit. And a patient um, you know, can do all their normal activities with that. It's really important to pick a good location. You want to make sure there are no skin folds, prior scars. Uh, you want to make sure an appliance will stick there easily and be comfortable for wherever the patient wears their belt and such. Uh, and because of that, we have the patient meet with uh, an ostomy nurse before surgery and try different positions, put a bag in a different location, and kind of in a collaborative way, we kind of pick a good location if someone is going to have that type of urinary mm -hmm. diversion. That's so that's a that's a... Uh, that's not a continent diversion. That's a uh, ileal conduit. Yeah, and nobody, nobody, you know, wants a bag per se. But just like you said, Dr. Santis, it's 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 the faster surgery, and for people that are generally older and sicker, which tend to be the bladder cancer type patients, uh, smokers, etc., um, it's it's the fastest, least kind of hassle way to do it. And like you mentioned, you got to put the urine tube somewhere because you have no bladder. Sure. Um, and and another um, good point I think you made is that enterostomal therapists. Nurses, nurse navigators, we'd all show with Maggie uh, right. about her role in it is that uh, 
Um, you need a lot of support and help for this. And those, those as we speak right now, Maggie is running an ostomy support group where patients with various types of stom stoma are talking about their experiences and, and such. That's wonderful. So you need a lot of support um, from our end for marking, location, and the mechanical stuff, Teaching. but also the, the psychological part of it for the patients now. Okay, so that's the, con that's the incontinent or just you know uh, bag type diversions. Mm -hmm. Now, um, there are unfortunately some people that are very young that aren't as sick that could perhaps benefit from what we call the continent urinary diversions or, or diversions sure. without a bag. Um, so tell, these me are, about, tell me about that. So these are more complex reconstructions. Um, the most common would be a, a, what we call a neobladder or a new bladder. So with this reconstruction, we take a longer segment of intestine. Rather than 10 or 15 centimeters, we take 55 centimeters. And with the bulk of it, we actually turn the tube into an open plate and then create and reconstruct a new bladder with a little chimney on it. The ureters get plugged into that chimney. And then at the bottom of that new reconstructed bladder, we would sew that back to the urethra. So there are a couple of caveats. Number one, you have to make sure there's no cancer down at the bladder neck towards urethra that could be invading down in that stump that you're leaving behind. Um, and then number two, you have to make sure that that, that neobladder can reach down to where the urethra is, that the mesentery, the blood flow to the, the intestine is long enough to be able to do that. And then it's a more complex reconstruction, so the recovery is a little bit longer. You can have a leak as it's healing. You have to leave a bunch of tubes in. The intestines make a bunch of mucus, so you have to irrigate these catheters and such while someone's recovering to make sure that uh, everything is flowing freely. When a patient goes home, uh, they may have a catheter in the urethra all the way into the neobladder that they irrigate. And kind of slowly stepwise, um, the catheter in the urethra, a catheter in the abdominal wall that goes into the neobladder, these things are removed as everything heals. And then a patient is left with no tubes and no stoma on their abdomen. Now, it takes a little while for that neobladder to increase in size to a fully functional size. And there are a couple of... Um, pitfalls and different kinds of things you have to keep an eye out along mm -hmm. the way. So one is that um, a patient can have mucus, so they potentially could have to learn how to catheterize and irrigate their neobladder out to make sure it's not building up mucus. Number two is that in some patients, they don't empty out all the way urinating with their neobladder, so a certain percentage of patients may have to catheterize several times a day their whole life. So I always tell someone they need to, if they want to do a neobladder, they have to have good manual dexterity and they have to understand worst case scenario, you could be someone that has to catheterize. And we have a lot of people in our practice who catheterize for other reasons uh, and to the general public it may sound horrifying to have to catheterize yourself, but it's something that many patients with neurologic processes or bladders that don't work learn how to do and live a normal life catheterizing them. So. And it's certainly a choice too because you know I think in, in cancer you feel powerless and helpless. I think a diversion choice, I mean some people unfortunately Patient's don't, have, some people don't have a choice at all if they're older and sick. We'd recommend mm -hmm. you know just the ileal conduit but for some people that are younger that are with it that know that sure. there's an awful lot of homework associated with it, it, it could be a good choice. Sure. And I'd also say that you know at night when your intestines are gurgling Sometimes the neobladder is more active at night. So some patients will be, if they sleep very heavily, will be prone to leaking some urine because the neobladder will leak at night. We call that nocturnal enuresis. So those patients, uh, I saw a man today who's a year out from a neobladder, and if he gets up twice a night to urinate, he'll be completely dry. But if he, you know, he drinks a six-pack or more of beer and sleeps heavily through the night, he might have some leakage if he doesn't get up to urinate. Yeah, I think um, if I had a six pack, I'd do the same thing. I think that's probably true. <laughs> so, so, you know, the neobladder potentially could have some nighttime leakage. You potentially could have to catheterize. Uh, also, some patients, uh, you know, many patients will be dry during the day, dry at night, and sure. feel like they have no issues at all and with no stoma. Yeah. So it could be a home run in patients as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. For the right kind of patient. Now, some people, like we discussed, you know, where the cosmetic appearance, you just want to get through the bladder cancer and save somebody's sure. life. But for some people, they have that additional, you know, yep. what's, what's life going to be after, after this stuff, you know? There are some reconstructions where we make a reservoir that collects the urine, but we can't hook it back up to the urethra. Maybe we've removed the urethra. Mm. 
Uh, and in that situation, we can make a reservoir that's hooked to a piece of intestine, almost like the ileal conduit, but a continent uh, reservoir where a patient would catheterize through this little stoma into this reservoir several times a day to empty the urine. So rather than a neobladder that connects back to the urethra, you could have a neobladder that sits there that then the patient catheterizes. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a less common but a possible reconstruction that's necessary in sure. some situations. And I think in uh, any, any urologist that's trained, particularly in the era that we have, we've had some experience with all of those diversions. Mm -hmm. And for patients that are looking these up, the, um, Dr. Sand is referring to the uh, Indiana pouch, which is commonly termed for that continent catheterizable stoma, which means the pouch that you put a tube in. Uh, the, the neobladder would be called, uh, the modern neobladder called the Studer neobladder, if you wanted to look that up, where there's a limb and the tubes go, the ureter tubes go into it and then to the chamber. And I had a patient uh, uh, once that had that done and she called it her designer, her designer bag, right. because these are literally hand sewn, um, sure. probably taking what, another two to three hours of work um, to, to put all this together. Probably and 90 it minutes. All up. Yeah, so, um, so it's, it's more work, but for the right patient, I think it could be very helpful. Now, we talked about how it's done and then that pathway. Um, since it is one of the biggest surgeries I think known to mankind, what do you tell the patients about the potential pitfalls? Because unfortunately with this big surgery with multi components, it does unfortunately have a high degree of risk, but necessarily so because of the gravity of the disease process. Sure. So the most common thing to keep someone in the hospital is waiting for bowel function to return. You've removed a segment of intestine and then you've sewn the, the, the bladder back together to you know, reestablish continuity. And you have to wait for the intestines to wake up and for air to go move across that anastomosis. So waiting for the intestines to gurgle, waiting for someone to pass gas so before you can feed them up is what keeps the patient in the hospital mm -hmm. the longest. There can be other complications, infection, heart problems, lung problems, skin infections. In general, these are not the world's healthiest patients. These are usually people who've smoked a pack a day or two packs a day for 40 or 50 years. So they're patients who have other medical problems and then we're putting them through uh, you know, a long surgery with mm -hmm. lots of fluid shifts and things like that. So I always tell patients, expect you're gonna have some bump in the road and whatever it is, we'll identify it, deal with it and you know, wait till everything's perfect before you go home. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are a lot of complications. Waiting for the bowels to wake up, lungs, cardiac problems, skin infections, uh, blood clot formation, things like that. Mm -hmm. We put people on medications to try to prevent blood clots. Before the surgery even, we give subcutaneous heparin injection. Mm -hmm. But still, it's a big surgery and, and patients with a lot of other medical problems. Yeah. People are usually in the hospital somewhere between six and 10 days. Mm -hmm. uh, occasionally, someone will go home five days after surgery. It's not uncommon someone has bumps in the road and could be in the hospital a couple of weeks. Sure, and a lot of it's all patient dependent. Everybody comes to the surgery with different you know, medical uh, issues, comorbidities, et cetera, et cetera. And I think a lot of, I think you've mentioned kind of the mantra amongst urologists, usually people that do cystectomies say, unfortunately, based on the data and the literature, you, you will have a complication, but hopefully it's not a bad one. You know, yeah. and by complication, quote unquote, it could be in the hospital for a couple of extra days. Unfortunately, it could also be a massive blood clot in your lungs, but um, and we're only really mentioning just to be on this, you know, just to be fair about what the procedure is, but I got to tell you with modern anesthesia, with modern urologic surgery, the, t the robotic techniques, the new bowel medications, it's a lot better and safer than it was before. And the it mortality used to be, rate's pretty low. It used low. to be that a high percentage of patients ended up in the intensive care unit. Uh, now I'd say it's rare that someone ends up in the intensive care sure. unit after a procedure like this. Yeah. I'll, I'll also add in that there are some very specific situations when we don't have to take out the bladder. If it is a small muscle invasive tumor um, uh, or a patient who's too sick to have their bladder out, occasionally we do bladder preservation protocols. These are things that are not done with a high frequency, but in that situation you would remove the tumor and all the bladder muscle underneath it as deep as you can, and then the patients would get chemotherapy and radiation uh, in a very complex protocol, and then tight surveillance of rebiopsying that area. So there are patients in certain situations where we can do this bladder preservation protocol. A high percentage of those patients end up getting their bladder out down the road, uh, but in certain situations that, that can be done. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, it has to be a very specific group of patients with a small muscle invasive tumor, and they have to be followed very, very closely. Mm -hmm.
Another corollary is there are some people that are just way too sick to even get that cystectomy or chemo, and then um, in the same vein as what you discussed, they just get very aggressive scrapings. Yes. And you hope for the best for those patients sure. you know, that are asking. You know. Sure. The other thing I'd say is with muscle invasive bladder cancer, the time between diagnosis and treatment actually does make a difference. Uh, so, you know, you've had uh, different uh, discussions about prostate cancer, which is a slower growing cancer, where you may have ample time to consider things. But there are studies looking at less than 12 weeks and greater than 12 weeks between diagnosis and removal of the bladder or starting chemotherapy. And it does make a difference in terms of long-term yeah. survival. So this is something that you want to uh, really have a good pathway and help move things along. This is why it's important to have a nurse navigator, uh, work well with your colleagues so you can get other consultations and clearance and imaging done so people can, can get from diagnosis to treatment fairly rapidly. Wonderful. Well, you know, thank you so much for the overview today. Dr. Santos, it's great sure. having you here.